Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all. I invite you to take your Bibles and join me in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's been our joy this month to immerse ourselves in the glories of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it comes here at the end of our study of 1 Corinthians. And 1 Corinthians has been a letter written to a group of believers in Corinth in the first century AD who had many problems and many struggles. In many ways, they are immature. In fact, early on in the letter in chapter 3, Paul laments the fact that they still can only take milk and have not matured onto more solid food. And they are struggling with their practices and their ethical behavior. And Paul has been gently and lovingly correcting them. And then we arrive at chapter 15, and it is much different. And in fact, this chapter is very different from everything we've read up to this point. This is not an issue related to some of their ethical practices, although that's going to come into play. It's not related to their, their practices of religious exercise, such as the Lord's Supper. This is about their belief. They have a wrong belief. And the issue upon which they are struggling and are confused is that of the resurrection itself. Chapter 15, verse 12. Paul says to them, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Indeed, they are confused on this issue. And so in this particular chapter, he has to correct their misbelief. And it's critical that they get this right. They need to understand the realities and the relevance and some of the rank and order of how the resurrection occurs. And as we'll see today, the renewal, the newness of life that comes with the resurrection he says in this chapter, chapter 15, verse 3, For I deliver to you as a as a first importance. First importance. This is a primary critical importance. You must get this right. And he tells them exactly what it is. What I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. They are confused about this. And they need to be corrected. And we've seen, he presents the reality of the resurrection. He quotes all the different witnesses, including himself. He talks about the relevance of the resurrection, that they probably not thought this through. That if there's no resurrection from the dead, then that means that Christ has not been resurrected from the dead. And if Christ has not been resurrected, that means that you will not be resurrected. And it means that death still reigns. Your sin has not been atoned for. The penalty is still in place. There's no hope for redemption and forgiveness. He's saying to them, I don't think you've thought this through. To what this means. And he even explains some things about the reality of how this occurs and that Jesus goes first. He is first in all things, including the resurrection. And then, of course, those who have died in Christ will be raised as well. And then we come to today's focus. And we're going to be looking at verses 29 through 42, the first part of 42 where he's really going to talk about the newness of life that occurs in Christians both before we die. There's a newness of life that comes to us before we pass away. And then, of course, there's a marvelous newness of life that comes 
at the resurrection, the bodily resurrection. So here's what he's going to do. And here's what we're going to have time for today. In verses 29 through 34, he's going to give us sort of a negative example of how their discussion about the resurrection is impacting their behavior. The fact that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead, the fact that you who are in Christ will be raised from the dead should and must change the way you live your life. It must change you. And we're not waiting for death for that change to show itself. And then after we die, at the bodily resurrection of the church, that too will be a renewal, a newness of life. And he's going to address both. And so the first is that sort of life we live before we die. And what, how should the resurrection change you? And he's going to give us a negative example. And then he's going to give us a positive example. And then when he talks about the newness of life, he's going to give us some real life practical examples of what the resurrection of the new body is like. And then sadly, spoiler alert, you got to wait till next Sunday to get really the really juicy glory stuff about that new resurrected body that awaits you. But it is, uh, it is glorious. And that'll take us through the end of chapter 15, leading right up. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday, leading right into the, res the celebration of the resurrection on March 31st. And so I hope that this has been a great, great encouragement to your, to your heart. So I want to say a couple of things before we just start reading these verses together. I want to talk about how are we made new by the resurrection. And this is really important because this refers to your life before you pass away. And it refers to your life when you are raised to newness. So how are we made new by the resurrection? And here's the answer. How are we made new? We are given a new moral nature. Our very moral nature is going to change. When you came to Christ, your very moral nature changed from wretched to righteous, from bad to good. And it's addressed here in 1 Corinthians 15. Some of this we'll get to today, but not all of it. But to just give you a hint of the focus of this, look at verse 42. He says, look at the end of that verse. It will be raised as an imperishable body, an incorruptible body. Not just incorruptible in that my flesh is slowly decaying and the older I get, the more aware I am of that. There's no reason to laugh at that. <laughs> no matter how true it is. It's imperishable and it's incorruptible in that sin and temptation to sin will have no impact on me, no influence. Verse 42, he says that it is raised an imperishable body. Verse 43, it is raised in glory. It is raised in power, it says in verse 43. And then, of course, in verse 52, he repeats this idea. That at the end of that verse, he says, we will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. Our very nature is going to change. We will go from being an enemy of God to being one who loves God. We will go from being one who is easily tempted and ensnared in the lust and pleasures of this world to one in whom that will have zero influence. And Paul's about to remind these Corinthians that that is not something that is just future. It's culminated in perfection with our resurrected bodies, but it's supposed to have an effect now. So how does the reality of the resurrection renew us before death? Well, first the negative example and then the positive example. And I'm going to just be up front with you. The, neg the negative example is really difficult to teach. Because quite frankly, it's not entirely clear what in the world Paul's talking about. Read verse 29. Let me read it. You follow along. So this is the negative example of, the, of how the resurrection can influence us in a really negative way if we don't understand it properly. 
we don't have a proper, mature understanding of the resurrection, this is what you get. Verse 29. Otherwise, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? That's a very strange phrase, isn't it? If the dead are not raised at all, why then are they baptized for them? Lots of pronouns causing trouble in that sentence. <laughs> the whole idea of what in the world does Paul mean by being baptized for the dead, that's a little uh, obscure. And I got to tell you, after studying this for the better part of, I don't know, three and a half months, I, I when I picked up 1 Corinthians to study it, I, I thought about how difficult it was going to be today to talk about this. Because there's a lot of confusion, and quite frankly, understandably, that we probably don't know for sure what he's talking about. It's interesting that Paul offers no criticism of what whatever it means to be baptized for the dead. He doesn't offer any critique of it or criticism of it. It's interesting that he uses the word those who do this instead of we who do this. It's interesting at the end when he says, why then are they baptized for them? Who's the they and who's the them? And you can guarantee when you get a verse like this in the Bible that is really obscure and difficult to understand and the historical context is a little foggy, you can rest assured cults will get hold of this and run as fast as they can off in 15 different directions. Maybe most famously would be the Mormons who actually engage in a sacrament that they call baptism for the dead. And they're going to point to this verse and say, this is why we do it. When there is literally no real firm understanding from the historical context of what in actually this was, what actually was going on here. The Mormons would argue that baptism is necessary to be saved. You cannot have a life of bliss eternal if you have not been baptized. Some have died and perished without being baptized. And so isn't it marvelous and wonderful that we can do this vicarious baptism? And their argument is pretty, pretty simple one. They say, well, Jesus died a vicarious death. I mean, he died in the place of another. And so we're just going to baptize someone in the place of another, and it'll have the same effect. Now, there are all kinds of logical problems with that, namely that, okay, well, Jesus is, 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 on a, is in a class all by himself. And uh, there's no one else who can take that, who can do this by care. My faith is not going to save you. And my baptism is not going to have any effect for you. This is not a concept that you can find in the scriptures. But you can see how a cult will get hold of, a, of just an obscure scripture. And this is the way they always do it. This is the way cults always operate. They take something that's a little mysterious, a little foggy, and then they just run with it and say, we can tell you exactly what this means when that's probably overstating the case. Others have argued that this is a reference to a pagan practice. That it's a superstitious sacrament, a perversion of baptism. Uh, there was a city of Eleusis, which is in Greece. It's right across the Gulf from Corinth. It's a little north of Corinth. And both Homer and in his writings, and Cicero, the Roman senator, the great orator, uh, mentioned Eleusis and their mystery cult and their ceremonial washings at the sea. And they had a vicarious practice of that, that you could do it for the dead. And so some look at this and say, well, Paul must be referring to that. That must be what he's, they're, they're copying that. Of course, the problem that creates is, well, why didn't he tell them to stop? <laughs> Why didn't he say, don't, don't do that pagan practice? He's had no trouble telling them that in the first part of the letter. He's had zero problem rebuking them. And yet here, strangely silent. Uh, others will argue that it's just some sort of benign practice. We don't know the real purpose of it, but it must have been fairly harmless. Paul is going to use it to make a point. And quite frankly, he finds it pretty benign. And whatever it is, is not that big of a deal. Some say it's Paul's practice to use baptism as a symbolism of death and being raised to life. And he certainly does that. He does that in his other letters. 
Uh, I'm going to read Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. He does use baptism as a metaphor for being buried with Christ and raised to life with Christ. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. Again, talking about this baptism, listen to what he says. Having been buried with him in baptism, so this idea of being under the water, buried with him, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And some theologians have argued, well, that's what he's talking about. It's just the spiritual dead. It's a baptism of the dead, those who are spiritually dead. And still others say it's being baptized because of the dead. It's a really difficult preposition in the Greek. It's a preposition, uh, hyper, 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 hyper uh, that can be translated multiple ways. And they said, well, really, it's a baptism because of the dead. You're being inspired by believers who went before you and their lives have inspired you to faith and, and the Holy Spirit is used to convict you. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you. There's a, there, there's a professor. I, I found one professor at uh, Dallas Seminary who said there were 200. He found 200 explanations of this. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to stop and I'm not going to give you all 200 because I don't think we need all 200. I think the reason, whatever this was, Paul is using it to say to them, you are not understanding the resurrection correctly. You're not teaching it correctly. Some of you are even denying it. And it's because of all that you're in using it in ways that have bear no resemblance to the implication it should have for your life. He says, why then are they baptized for them? He's saying, listen, what you, whatever this is, whatever this baptism for the dead is, what good is it for you to do it if there's no resurrection? That's his argument. And that's really the bigger point is that they are doing a thing that really makes absolutely no sense if they're going to deny the resurrection. He said, you're confused about it? It's, this is really a negative example of how the resurrection should change your life today in a meaningful way. Then he goes right into a positive example. How should the resurrection affect you right now? March 17th, 2024. What should it be doing to you? Well, Paul gives his own life as an example of how the resurrection should change you, the reality of it. Let me read verses 30 through 34. Uh, I think I'll do 30 through 32, and then we'll tack on 33 and 34 to, in a minute. 30 and 31 for sure. Why are we also in danger every hour? I protest, brethren, by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me if the dead are not raised? I'm going to stop there for a minute. What's his argument? He's saying, listen, I have put my life at risk for the gospel. I have come near death many, many times for the gospel. And if there is no resurrection, then I am a fool for doing that. That is nonsense. That is pointless. How much has he put his life at risk? Well, join me in 2 Corinthians, the very next letter in your Bible. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Also speaking to them. I'm going to start in verse 23. And in verse 23, Paul is addressing some of his critics. And uh, he's kind of questioning their, uh, their legitimacy, their validity. And notice how he puts it. Verse 23, he says, are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. <laughs> I more so. In far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. 
Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. I think if I do the math, that's 195 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. If there's no resurrection of the body, Paul is saying, I'm, I'm a fool. Why would I risk death? Why would I put myself in danger? If there was no resurrection of the dead, he's saying your life needs to show that you are bold and fearless and faithful because you believe in the reality of the resurrection. That it is a reality for you in Christ Jesus. And you live every day with that reality governing you. You don't study the scriptures so you can know a little bit about God today. You study the scriptures to know God and to love God because you are going to spend eternity with God. It's a motivation for all you do and say. It impacts all that we think. And it directs us into a boldness for Christ Jesus. Not a reservedness as if this life is all that there is. In fact, if this life is all that there is, our morals would look a lot different, wouldn't they? And he talks about that at the end of verse 32. He says, if the dead are not raised, let us eat, drink. Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. What a great philosophy. Isn't that great? Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Become sober-minded as you ought and stop sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Yeah, it was the Epicureans who said, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you will be dead. I mean, the, it, if there's no resurrection of the dead, and this life is all that there is, then why shouldn't I pursue pleasure at all costs and minimize discomfort at all costs. Whether I have to lie or cheat or steal. And quite frankly, when you look at most, if you look at the way the world behaves, the world's philosophy, this is why they do what they do. Why do corrupt people act the way they do? Because they think this is it. And you better grab all the gusto, gusto you can. It's carpe diem, man. Seize the day. Because there's no guarantee of tomorrow. So you, need, so you want to pursue all the pleasure you can. You want to pursue all the wealth you can. You want to pursue everything that will be pleasurable in this life. Because once you die, that's it. And that would make perfect sense, wouldn't it? And listen, the Greeks taught this, but there's nothing new about this. I think humans have always kind of understood that you might as well seize all the pleasure you can. Isaiah chapter 22, Isaiah explains it to us in no uncertain terms. It says, yeah, if this life is it, if this is all there is, then this should be your philosophy right here. Of course, Isaiah is going to argue that this is not all that there is, and this should not be your philosophy. Isaiah 22, 13. Instead, there is gaiety and gladness, killing of cattle and slaughtering of sheep, eating of meat and drinking of wine. Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we may die. Well, listen, if there's no resurrection of the dead, that makes perfect sense. Absolute perfect sense. Paul says, do not be deceived. Do not let this lie have a work in you. Your death is not the end. In many ways, it is just the beginning. 
And so rather than eat, drink, and be merry, he says in verse 34, be sober. He's, he's, he's implying the exact opposite of that. Be sober-minded. Stop sinning, because that's not going to go unpunished. He said, for some have no knowledge of God. He said, this is not to your honor, this is to your shame. He said, you, this is a shameful thing that you are doing. He said, these people who are denying the gospel, they are going to corrupt you. They're denying the resurrection. They're going to corrupt you. Don't learn from them. Don't follow their example. Ignore their advice. Don't be led into a hedonistic, pleasure-seeking, experiential here and now. They mock Christianity by denying the new life. They are disreputable and they mock Christ and they bring shame to our faith. This is a matter of first importance. Christ died, he was buried, and he was raised again, and those in him will be. This is a strong rebuke. You know, up until now, he's been pretty, um, up until now, he's been, uh, he's been fairly patient with them in this letter. He's only had a couple of really strong rebukes for them, but most of the time he's been kind of, kind of patient. He doesn't want to shame them. Back in chapter 4, 1 Corinthians, chapter, um, 1 Corinthians 1, chapter 4, he says, I'm, I'm not trying to shame you. He says, I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. When he gets to this thing about the resurrection, he says, no, I think here I'd like to shame you. <laughs> this is shameful that you are denying the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He just calls them ignorant. <laughs> By the way, where does he get that? Well, we read this last week, but I'll just remind you what we read in Mark chapter 12 when the Sadducees are playing games with Jesus and they're, they're asking him these silly questions about the resurrection. They don't believe in the resurrection and they're trying to entrap him and they come up with this really weird situation where seven brothers, uh, one marries and then he dies and then because of the, the law of Moses, each one of them takes her as a wife and then they're all dead and then they ask this silly question and they say, well, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? And Jesus' response to them is just classic. He says, you people are fools. You're just fools. Going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, but someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? Verse 36, Paul says, you fool. You're just being ignorant. <laughs> Stop. Stop being ignorant. Stop being a fool. This is to their shame. When you believe and know that there is more to your existence than the here and now, and that you're, there's more to your existence than just living a life on this earth until you die, and you realize that is not the end. It's going to affect the way you live every day. It's going to change the way you live every day. And it's going to give you a, it bring you into a matter of first importance, the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the Corinthians are missing that. So he says, yes, this should change you before you die. In other words, we're not waiting to die for the reality of the resurrection to change our lives. We're not. We want to experience that glorious new life right now, March of 2024, with a boldness and a courage in which we pursue the gospel. But he doesn't stop there. He then talks about what happens after we die. And he talks about a bodily renewal. And so I'm going to read again verse 35. And so what he's going to do is he's going to, he's going to raise a question that they probably raised with him. They raised a question with him, and uh, he's going to answer it with three examples. But someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? You know, that's not a, that's not a silly question. Listen, there's a lot of people that say, I'm not sure I want that old body back. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know that... I want that. And quite frankly, you know what the Greeks were taught? 
flesh is evil and the spirit is good. The whole goal was to get away from this body. And here's Paul saying, oh, no, no, you're going to be reunited with it. And they're saying, I don't want that. I don't, I don't want that. I'm, I'm trying to get away from the flesh. I'm trying to mortify the flesh. I'm going to be happy when I'm separated from this flesh. Well, his answer to that, as I just said, was, you fool. And then he gives him three examples. He says, listen, you want to know what it's like? Uh, he's going to give you three examples and say, it's kind of like this. Number one, he uses the idea of a seed that falls into the ground and dies and bring forth some, it brings forth something new. He says, you fool, that which you sow does not come to life until it dies. And that which you sow, you, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body just as he wished and to each of the seeds, a body of his own. So he takes something that they're all super aware of. And you're not going to be able to see this. I put it on red paper in the hopes that at least you can tell the size from way back there in the back. But I just took a, a couple of seeds and put them on this. Those of you up front can see how small these seeds are. Unless you're really, really uh, good at this, you may or may not know what kind of seed that is. But if you drop that seed into the ground and take care of it, it'll produce this. Now, I think we'd all agree, those, that's, pretty, that's pretty different. <laughs> and if you dug up the roots of a lemon tree that produced this, you're never going to find that. It's gone. It's not there anymore. And he says in verse 42... So also is the resurrection of the dead. He said, it's just like that. God is going to take what has now died and gone into the ground, and he is going to bring it to life in a new way. It's not going to be like the old thing. It's going to be a new thing. And he says, you see this every single day. They were very much more an agrarian society than we are. Some of you have a green thumb and you grow quite a bit. Some of us have no green thumb and we don't grow anything. We go to the grocery store to get that. But I think we all realize, yes, this, these are two very different things. But this gave birth to this. He said resurrection is like that. It's going to be new. Where did Paul get this example? Well, from Jesus. Jesus said this very same thing. Let me read it to you. John chapter 12, verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And then to that he adds, he who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world shall keep it to life eternal. In other words, he who loves his life, let's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow I'm going to be dead. He's going to lose his life. But the one who doesn't love his life but loves God shall keep it to life eternal. What an irony. So that's his first example. Example number one. And that is this seed. Example number two is like it. Verse 39. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of men and another flesh of beast and another flesh of birds and another of fish. He's making the same argument. He says, look, you realize that there is difference in this animated matter. God has made things completely different. There is a difference between a robin and an earthworm and a spider and a pig and a blue whale. There's a variety of flesh all around you. God is able to raise up things as he wants them. In fact, one biologist speculates, and I don't know, this, this number may be low, that if you took the total number of combinations of, of amino acids in every living thing, 
it would be 10 to the 108th power. For those of you who don't know what that means, that's 10 with 108 zeros after it. And that's just an estimation, and it may be quite low. Life is everywhere, and it is different. The hide of a pig is tough, and a slug is vulnerable. A tortoise shell is, is rough and hard, but the wings of a butterfly are delicate and vulnerable. He says in verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. God is going to raise you to newness of life. And you will be changed. And then he gives one more example. The glories of the lights in the heaven. Verse 41. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. For star differs from star in glory. And we've all seen that. We can look up into a night sky. Some stars are brighter than others. Some twinkle brighter. Some that they would have seen are solid and move. We now know those are planets. The glory of a full moon is different than the glory of a setting sun. The crescent moon looks different from a half moon and a full moon. So you can see the glorious, the glories of their changing. They go from quite glorious, a full moon, to a new moon that's not very glorious at all. And then he says in verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. Yes, I may be buried in dishonor and I may be buried as perishable, but I'm going to be raised to life in glory, it says, and in power. Just as every star doesn't give the same light for its whole life and every moon changes and the sunset changes and even during the seasons, we all know the sun's a lot different in July than it is on Jan in January. So will you be. Buried kind of like the new moon with no glory. Raised to life like the glorious sun. So what is different about my resurrected body? Well, you have to come back next week. <laughs> Verses 42 through 58. However, there's nothing stopping you from reading it every day this week. Amen. There's nothing stopping you. You don't, you don't really have to wait till next week to hear about the glories of these new resurrected bodies. He says they're going to change. They're going to change like this seed changed into a lemon. They're going to change like we see the different flesh around us. They're going to change like a new moon to a full moon. They're going to change. How are you going to change? Well, I can't wait to talk about that next week. Actually, I can't wait. It's time for us to pray <laughs> and to uh, sing together and be dismissed. So let's pray and thank God for the glories of the new life in Jesus Christ. Well, Lord, we do just want to close today by saying thank you. Each one of us has good cause to praise you. You have come to us while we were yet sinners, while we were shaking our fist in your face and crying out for your crucifixion. You came and you died while we were yet sinners because you loved us and because you had a plan for our lives and that plan is one that includes eternal life and a resurrection. And we thank you for that today. We want to live like people who know that and believe it. We have nothing to fear. If this world comes and takes our life, it is all the better for us. Because we have the promise of the resurrection. So Lord, help us to live that way today tomorrow, like people of the resurrection, like people who know and understand that there's no reason to be caught up in the sin of earthly pleasures because they are momentary and give no real peace and no real hope. But in your resurrection, we hope and we know. So as we head out today, keep us from sin. Keep us from the schemes and the lies and the deceit of the evil one. Keep us from the pleasures of our culture that promises that it will make us happy and give us joy when it's just a lie. 
and help us to take our comfort in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And help us be a people that it won't be to our shame, but it will be to your glory that we believe and we live thus. And we pray and ask this humbly in his name. Amen.